Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News where today it's all about ladies making headlines in Hollywood and our first story is about relative, uh, relatively new screenwriter Meg Lafave getting a major promotion at Disney Animation to co-director on their upcoming Gigantic and this story is interesting for two reasons. The first is that it shows the increasing role that women are playing in the higher ranks of Disney animation, which is a relatively new phenomenon. Fascinating because women, of course, have been fans of Disney animation from the very beginning, but they started out as ink and paint girls and are now co-directing these movies. Uh, but then the second reason this is interesting is because Meg Lafave has had a very interesting career path uh, that has led her to her current status. And we talk a lot about building careers in Hollywood here on the show, so I thought it would be interesting to a number of you to see exactly what Meg Lafave did. All right, so anyway, let's start with the first point, and that's the expanding role of women at Disney Animation. So they started out as I said, ink and paint girls. And we actually don't have any major that I can think of female animators even. You know, for, for decades, you know, Disney's really played up uh, their, their major animators. You know, the people who lead the characters, the character design, like Glenn Keane, for instance, right? Uh, and while his daughter did assist with some of the design, the artistic design, uh, like um, a Mary Parent uh, on Tangled, you know, she's not an animator. So there are very few female stars at Disney Animation, even though, again, the fan base is very female. But uh, Linda Wolverton, of course, was a, was a major person on Beauty and the Beast. She wrote that script. And then Brenda Chapman uh, did technically co-direct uh, Brave over at Pixar, but was had such a problem getting along with everybody that she was actually fired off the picture. But uh, I think because of some legal matters, whatever, she actually ended up, you know, accepting the Oscar, which was pretty hilarious. But anyway, that of course changed with Jennifer Lee, who, like Meg Lefauve, started out as a screenwriter on Frozen, just as Meg Lefauve started out as just a screenwriter on Gigantic, but both, because of their creative input on the projects, were promoted to co-director. Jennifer Lee, along with uh, Chris Buck on Frozen, uh, she got an Oscar too, and let's see if Meg Lefauve can get one with Gigantic. Uh, and she will be co-directing with Tangled's Nathan Greeno. And I think it's interesting because, you know, obviously Frozen is very female-centric, but for Gigantic, as we, uh, as we learned at D23 last year, the giant is going to be a girl. So I guess that they wanted to make sure they got an authentic female voice uh, because that proved so not only effective, but financially uh, rewarding with Frozen that they probably wanted to have that same success with Gigantic. So they brought in Meg Lefauve, Jennifer Lee, of course, very busy on not only working on Frozen 2, uh, but also A Wrinkle in Time that uh, Ava DuVernay will be directing, a live action movie. So it's interesting. Who knows where Meg Lefauve will go from here because Jennifer Lee so quickly crossed over to live action. Uh, but very interesting. So that's the more female talent in Disney animation Half. Now, for the other half about Meg Lefauve's career path, uh, even though she's new to the screenwriting game, hasn't done a lot, she's been in the business for quite a long time uh, because she started out as Jodie Foster's assistant and then was uh, promoted at Jodie Foster's production company, Egg Pictures, uh, to producer and eventually president. But after a while, Meg Lefauve decided, you know what? I want to be a screenwriter. So she actually was trained at the Sundance Writers Lab. And I think it's important to point out that with a lot of these programs, but in particular Sundance, the people that get into them are connected in the industry. Now, they're usually not big names, unless sometimes a big name wants to change a career path, right? Often people in front of the camera wanting to go behind it. But usually they already have an agent, they have a manager, someone who can talk to the people at Sundance. And Jodie Foster, being like a pretty big deal, uh, you know, both in front of and behind the camera, I'm sure that, you know, she's attended festivals, Egg Pictures has attended festivals, and therefore Meg Lefauve had done the rounds. So uh, I think that there are some writers' programs, like what uh, Warner Brothers is going to be doing with their diversity program in the Disney Writers Lab. They genuinely take new people. We'll talk about the Disney writing program in just a moment. But I think that Sundance in particular is a little infamous for only taking connected people. But they did a great job with Meg Lefauve, who was able to go to the go from the president of Jodie Foster's production company to successful screenwriter. So what has she written? Well, she's uh, she went to Pixar out of Sundance, and she did Inside Out, 
um, the good dinosaur, which she was Oscar nominated on Inside Out, the good dinosaur, and she's working on the upcoming Captain Marvel. And by the way, I, like I think the only other really you know big female name in screenwriting right now, Nicole Perlman, is also writing on the, uh, working on that Captain Marvel script. Uh, Nicole Perlman came from the Disney writing program, and she uh, went to Guardians of the Galaxy right away. What a program! Uh, and she's also doing uh, Detective Pikachu for Legendary. So, interesting career paths there, and I thought that uh, would not only give a lot of you some ideas, but a better idea of how to navigate the industry. And also how sometimes you can backdoor your way into the career you want by taking um, an office job to start, make those connections, uh, and then get into the creative side of the business eventually. All right, so the second story of the day is that suddenly Angelina Jolie wants to work. And I suspect this is because when she decided to divorce Brad Pitt, the, the narrative that took place was that Brad Pitt wants to stay in Hollywood and continue to be a big movie star, while Angelina Jolie, who is essentially retired at this point, the only thing she really has on the, on the um, or had on the horizon was maybe Maleficent 2, uh, she wants to retire and become like a, you know, a UN ambassador and travel the world doing goodwill. And I think Angelina Jolie didn't like that narrative. And she was like, man, I need to work more because that is believable. And Angelina Jolie, by the way, is very PR savvy. She doesn't even have a publicist. She handles it all herself, which is amazing. So looking to pick, looking to act some more and to silence that narrative, uh, sure enough, she got a uh, headline going that she is in talks to do uh, to star in the adaptation of Shoot Like a Girl, the biography of Major Mary Jennings Hager, who was a helicopter pilot in Afghanistan for the military. And I have to say, no matter what you think about Angelina Jolie personally, I think she's very savvy professionally, and this is an excellent project for her. Now, Major Mary Jennings Hager is a Purple Heart recipient, and she, this is what's really interesting, she helped to eliminate the military's policy of keeping women out of combat roles. And I think that's huge. I think that could be a very interesting movie and it would be so interesting also to compare it to G.I. Jane and to see how far we've come in the way women are depicted in the military, you know, in, from Hollywood. So I think that's exciting. I think Angelina Jolie, I think that's a great role for her. I think that she would, you know, she would bring a lot to it. Uh, and, it, you know, it's one of those things we've been talking a lot about star power and that stars are priceless in the right role. And this is, I think, definitely the right role for Angelina Jolie. So, you know, this, Angelina Jolie, basically, when she's when she wants to, She's super on point, right? So it's really just a matter of if she's is willing to do the work. So the third story of the day, talking about work, is Sigourney Weaver, who uh, accidentally let it slip to Wired Magazine in an interview that she has some homework, uh, and that's watching Marvel movies. So the way this came up is that Wired Magazine was asking her about uh, female roles in superhero movies. And she referenced Marvel, interestingly enough, and said, oh, you know, I've been watching a lot of Marvel movies and they cast really good actors. And the point she was trying to make was that to sell a fantasy movie, which is what a superhero film is, you need a really good actor to, you know, she feels make the organic connections, right? Like uh, to make it not seem cheesy or, you know, like a B movie. And um, I think there's some truth to that. But I think it's funny that she would, I think that if she wasn't maybe gonna be in a Marvel movie, we'll get to that in a moment, she maybe would have mentioned the fact that Marvel is infamously sidelined Black Widow, right? Uh, even though the character is so incredibly popular. So while I think that Marvel has done a lot for the superhero genre, they have not done a lot for women in the superhero genre. I think Jessica Jones was great. We'll see how Captain Marvel uh, works out. And Scarlet Witch and Black Widow are both very popular, but they don't get nearly the amount of face time uh, that their male counterparts do. But anyway, it looks like she's up for a Marvel movie and is considering whether or not she wants to do it. I think it's hilarious that Sigourney Weaver has not yet seen any of these movies. It's like, really, Sigourney Weaver? Some of them are the biggest movies of their respective years. How are you not just you know, professionally curious about what's going on over there? But she's watching them now, and Wired Magazine said, why are you watching Marvel movies? And she's like, I can't tell you. So she basically told us. So Joshua Smith, a BTT viewer, tweeted me this story and said, Janet Van Dyne, and I think that's a great guess. I think that she looks a little bit like Evangeline Lilly, and I think she looks a little bit like the way the character's been drawn in the comics over the years. And that would make Ant-Man and Wasp a really interesting movie, because when you think about it, you would have an Ant-Man and Wasp of two different generations, right? You'd have Michael Douglas and Sigourney Weaver, and then Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly. Two fantastic couples. And I think one of the great things about Ant-Man and Wasp is that they are truly like a, a couple, uh, 
uh, and partners, uh, uh, superheroes, which we don't see anywhere else. So I think that's really, I think that would be a really interesting uh, movie, and especially if they could cross cut, you know, between those situations or have them both working at the same time. I don't know how it would work. I wouldn't want to watch a whole movie of Sigourney Weaver de-aged with computers because I, I don't think it looked even that good in Civil War with Robert Downey Jr. Like you were like, oh, that's a neat trick, but you were always aware that it was a trick. But I think she'd be a fantastic Janet Van Dyne, uh, and I, I think that's a very good guess by Joshua Smith. So I'm curious, what do you think of Sigourney Weaver in Marvel movies, and do you think she'd get as juicy a role as Janet Van Dyne? I'm sure Glenn Close is like, I should have waited. All right, although Kate Blanchett as Hella, I think is gonna be amazing. All right, so the viewer question of the day. This was a, okay, I don't think this was like maybe necessarily a really serious question or like like this person legitimately wanted this answered, but I thought it was an important discussion point. So I picked it as a viewer question. So this is from Avenger 07. So Avenger 07 says, why is it, su why is it surprising is my question if the get down is a, I'm gonna censor this, crap show that doesn't deserve any support in the first place from everyone, why does it have to be only about the black community? Uh, but what's really sad is that the Queen of Cotway is not getting any support. So basically, I was talking yesterday about Nate Parker, and I said, you know, if the black community doesn't support these films, what hope do they have in the long run? Talking about Queen of Cotway and um, the Get Down really doing poorly in viewership. So I wanted to explain why this is. Well, first of all, I want to defend the Get Down. It's not a crap show, and it got 74% on Rotten Tomatoes. So I think... You know, I think that you have to be careful not to color things, uh, you know, not to spin them in a way to try and make your point, right? Like, well, the, nobody saw the get down because it was bad. Well, no, but, uh, based on those numbers, a lot of people didn't even try the get down. So they had no idea whether it was good or bad. But here's where things get particularly bad, all right? So the get down, 74% on Rotten Tomatoes, one of the lowest watched things on Netflix ever. The Birth of a Nation is coming out this Friday. We discussed that yesterday. But uh, some box office reports came out late last night that it's predicted in its semi-wide release to open with seven or eight million. Uh, it might make it to 10. That would be absolutely horrible. Just to give you some perspective, When the Bow Breaks, which opened last month, which was a um, you know uh, all-black thriller, that opened with 14.2. So The Birth of a Nation would probably, it was looking to get, realistically, half of that. That's really bad. Uh, and when the Bow Breaks had a wider release, you know, it was in more theaters, but The Birth of a Nation should have a higher per theater average considering the importance of the film, you know, so that's really bad. I would say this is similar to Ghostbusters versus Bad Moms, right? Like people really didn't support Ghostbusters, but they did, interestingly enough, support Bad Moms. Uh, Ghostbusters did not make enough money at the box office, uh, but Mad Bad Moms was a huge success. So, but you know, women uh, women in movies are still struggling as well. So, I think that any demographic that wants to see themselves in movies more needs to rep needs to support the films that do that because Hollywood takes their cues not from what you say but from what you pay to see. So you can say till you're blue in the face that you want more, more diversity in movies, uh, you know, if you want more people of color in films, if you want more women, but if you don't actually pay to see them, Hollywood doesn't believe you. I mean, they'll try it because you make a lot of noise, but then if you don't back it up with actually going to see those properties, Hollywood's like, they're full of crap, they don't actually want it. Or if, or if they do, they're, you know, they don't want it enough to actually go and see it. So I'd like, because here's the thing, the status quo, you know, what people want changed is going just fine. Movies are coming out, they have almost entirely white male leads, and they're doing great at the box office. You know, they're making hundreds of millions, if not billions, of, like over a billion dollars. So Hollywood, of course, isn't going to change that, especially why would they swap out movies that make so much money for movies that don't? And so I want to just tell you about the top 10 here, okay? So, so far for the year, and domestically, the only film in the top 10 that has a non-white lead is The Jungle Book. Then if you want to find a film that has a non-white lead, it's Central Intelligence with Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart. That's at number 14 domestically, and it has only 127.4 million, whereas the movies in the top 10 have 300 million plus, right? Uh, then globally, just also to further this conversation, outside of China's The Mermaid and Monster Hunt, so you can see why the Chinese box office is being courted so much, uh, Central Intelligence, uh, there's only The Jungle Book again, is the only film with a non-white lead in the top uh, 20, 20 plus, because Central Intelligence is the highest again, but that's only at number 25 worldwide. Even When you open it up to worldwide audiences, it's actually even worse, even though you would think to some degree that would be a more diverse audience, right? So Central Intelligence at number 25, 
made 215.9 million worldwide, while the movies in the top 10 are for the most part 500 million plus. So you can see there's a huge discrepancy versus who they're casting. And Hollywood, you know, some of you I'm sure will argue that Central Intelligence isn't as good a movie as the other ones, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll have a little bit of a better example when Black Panther comes out, when Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman come out. That'll be maybe a little bit, you know, we'll have a, a true test there. But this is not a good sign for Hollywood when they're deciding financially what to do. Uh, but it does prove, I have to say, that The Rock deserves to be. He's the high, you know, it's interesting. His movies aren't the highest grossing, but he was right now the highest paid actor in Hollywood. And I think that since Will Smith, he's the only actor of color who can, you know, convincingly open a movie. So that's why you have to back these things up if you want to see change. But if you, and if you don't back them up, if you don't go to pay to see these movies, uh, they're not going to, they're going to continue to make them because they'll be like, people are happy with the way things are because it's like, it's basically like voting, right? Like you can say whatever you want, uh, you know, in the news, on Twitter, uh, you know, in person. But, you know, the real thing that will settle it is the outcome of the, of the vote. And that's just the way it is. All right, so I hope that's helpful and that explains the situation a little bit better. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in today. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories, Avenger 07's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank you.